Okay, so um, it is a pleasure uh, to have uh, uh, Federico uh, with us, uh, Morelli. So he's a, a PhD student at uh, uh, Polytechnic in Paris. And uh, um, so today his talk is about uh, a couple of uh, papers, uh, interrelated papers. Uh, I think they use the same model, so it makes sense for him to group them into uh, an individual talk. Uh, as uh, always, if you have uh, questions, clarificatory questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, um, we'll try to manage those during the seminar. Uh, more substantive questions, I would ask to keep, you, uh, to keep those for the uh, end of the seminar. Uh, okay, Federico, for you, it's yours. My turn. Yeah, so, okay, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, journal club. So, as, um, as you probably know, uh, my name is uh, Federico Morelli, and I'm currently working, I'm a third year PhD. I'm split uh, between Sorbonne Université and Ecole Polytechnique. And I'm working with Marco Tarzia, Michael Benzaken, and Ron Philippe Pouchot, and on a project and that I'm going to present you uh, today. And the title of my presentation is Confidence Collapsing a DSG-like Model. So I wanted, first of all, to, to give you some kind of background. So I would like to start with uh, two quotes. Uh, the first one by Olivier Blanchard, who said that we in the field did think of the economy as roughly linear, constantly subject to different shocks constantly fluctuating, but naturally return into equilibrium over time. The problem is that we came to believe that this was indeed the, the, the way the world worked. And the second one uh, by Jean-Claude Trichet, models failed to predict the crisis and seem incapable of explaining what was happening. In face of the crisis, we felt abandoned by conventional tools. So the question is, after the 2008 global financial crisis, um, people started realizing that the, that the model they were considering uh, for, for policy, um, for, for the monetary policy, were not adapted to, to account for, um, for crisis. But when we investigate about the different models that are now present in, in the macroeconomical models landscape, there are two uh, main categories. So the first one, uh, DSG model that stand for dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. And the second one macro category is uh, the agent based model. So on the one hand, DSG model describe a fully rational agent that maximize some, some kind of utility function. While on the other hand, the agent based model do not make any assumption over rationality in general. And of course, uh, the ESG model, they are coarse grain models, so they are mean field model, um, and they have a representative agent, a representative firm, a central bank that they interact. While the ABM models are very easily um, adapted to, take, to account for heterogeneities and interaction. Another difference is that the DSG, as the name uh, suggests, they are uh, general equilibrium. So there are models that can be linearized um, around the single equilibrium. While the ABM, um, ABM models, they are in general nonlinear and out of equilibrium. And last but not least, uh, DSG have been the workers for monetary policy in the last decades at least, while ABM have been only recently introduced as a tool for, for the macroeconomic analysis. So the idea of my research is to see whether we can stretch uh, this DSG paradigm and to, to, to answer the question whether it exists an overlap, uh, a non-empty overlap with the ABM um, way of thinking. So before doing that, I would like just to uh, recall briefly what is a DSG model. I, I think mo uh, a lot of you already know. But, um, so the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model describes the interaction between a representative household, a representative firm, and a central bank. And their goal is to determine some macroeconomical variables, such as the consumption, the working hours, the wages, and how um, 
the external shock, the exogenous shock propagates within the system. And of course, the, the ultimate goal is to determine the, the interest rate and the inflation and fix to fix those, those, um, those observable. Um, the idea is that how is how to build interaction between the households and the firm, right? So the household has a utility function, which is concave in the consumption term, which is uh, C, and it's, uh, it's convex in the, in the labor that the household provide to the firm. And of course, like uh, people do want to consume and they don't want to work, but the households unfortunately have to deal with some kind of uh, budget constraint where the outcome uh, must equate the, the income, let's say in the simplest form. So uh, the, income, the income are represented by the, uh, by the wages, U uh, times the labor that I've provided plus uh, the bond that I've matured at time T minus one. And my, my, um, what, I'm, what I'm buying is just my consumption plus the new bonds that I'm buying at a price one over one plus R, where R is the interest rate, of course. And on the other hand, we have uh, the firm that has a production function, uh, Y, that is uh, concave, um, in uh, the labor provided by the firm and is linear on the exogenous shock, which is now represented by the, uh, a technology uh, that they call Z Z uh, Zeta. And they have a profit function, which reads uh, just the consumption, how much uh, I've sold, minus uh, the wages that I've paid to the firm to provide the labor. So, the idea is that the house has maximized not only the utility, but it's the stream of expected utility subject to the budget constraint. And on the other hand, the firm maximizes profit, uh, assuming that the market clears. And the simple solution uh, provides three equations, right, that are linearly independent. So, uh, so there's the utility maximization, the profit maximization, and of course, the market clearing. We have three equations, uh, three unknowns that, you know, you, they provide a unique solution and therefore all the macroeconomical variables depend only on the exogenous shock. So this present, uh, this just, if you think about it a little bit more deeply, this has some weaknesses. The first one is somehow the causality. So the economy does not depend on the past but only on the future expectation of my economy. In fact, the also do not look at what has happened, but they just look uh, at the stream of expected utility. And of course there is a, a single equilibrium. So the, the economy just oscillates uh, around this equilibrium and it doesn't allow for, um, for, for economical crisis, for example. Uh, and then the, exo the, the shocks are purely exogenous and it's kind of funny to talk now that this is actually a problem, but in reality, we do know by experience that we have also some endogenous um, flash crisis, for example, in the financial market, or even the, the deep reason of the 2008 global financial crisis are thought to be uh, mostly endogenous. But in reality, what is happening is exogenous, exogenous shocks and endogenous shock go together uh, in the DSG framework, the endogenous part is a little bit uh, um, not considered. And of course, uh, we do think that they are kind of oversimplified as the market clearing uh, is not realistic. So the first step we can do to move um, from a DSG to a um, ABN is to consider a DSG, which is, uh, with uh, many different households that are interacting. And the economy of course is ruled by the same exact, uh, the same, the same principle as before, so nothing changes. And another step we can do is not only we consider many households, but we can consider many households that interacts and we can add a, a kind of feedback in the utility function, right? This feedback F highlighted in red which contains a term that depends on the previous time step consumption of, of, um, of our neighbors. And the neighbors are determined by this uh, social network that they called GIJ. So there are two possibilities uh, when considering uh, this uh, GIJ, for example. The first one is uh, to, to consider the homogeneous uh, limit, 
which basically means that uh, we take a fully connected graph and we take the thermodynamic limit in the number of households. So we let to the number of households uh, diverge and the graph is fully connected. And therefore we recover the mean field approximation of the DSG where people are sensitive to the same information. And the utility function reads, um, reads uh, is, is a little bit simpler, of course. And we have only aggregate, um, aggregate we talk about aggregate variables. Or uh, the other case is, of course, to, to, to consider the heterogeneous case where the network has a general structure and the heterogeneity is, must be implemented in some way. So in this first part of, the, of my talk, I will uh, try to focus on the homogeneous limit because uh, it's, it, he has some very interesting properties. So if we go back to the... Um, to the solution of the DSG model, we can see that the only thing that changes is now the introduction of this feedback F in the utility function uh, that, that somehow bonds the consumption at time t to the consumption at time t minus one, the aggregate uh, consumption. And if we solve again, same uh, principia, um, we have the utility maximization, the profit and the market clearing. We obtain a solution that, uh, um, uh, we obtain a solution that reads uh, C uh, is equal to Z uh, times uh, this feedback function uh, of uh, the aggregate consumption at time t minus one. And now there is the, the crucial question is how to, how, uh, what fu function can describe better this feedback me mechanism? And what we thought is that we can uh, take a function that has uh, an S shape, right? Uh, because if we want to, to model um, a confidence uh, mechanism of confidence feedback, we want that if at time t minus one, we have consumed uh, very little, then we are kind of anxious about the state of the economy itself and therefore our consumption drops consequently. While if of the previous time step we have consumed a lot, uh, then we are quite confident about the health of the economy, the global health of the economy. And, uh, uh, and we kind of, uh, our consumption is boosted by our, our, confident, uh, our confidence, uh, sorry. And when modeling an S-shaped function, there are uh, basically two parameters that are key. The first one, is the steepness at the center, which is represented here by theta, which basically um, represents the sensitivity of the, of, of the agent, of the representative agent to, to the consumption changing, changes. And the second one is the confidence threshold that, that uh, I called C0 here, and which represents the, way, the, 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 the consumption where the concavity of this feedback function changes. And we can see that when we, we, we study the equilibrium, right, we can have um, different possibilities that represent different phases. So the first phase is um, for, for, for when C0 is, it's, is small, uh, we have that uh, the right hand side and left hand side of the, of the equation just equates at one single point that correspond to a high output scenario. Um, I have put consumption scenario. And this is somehow what we call phase A, but this, it can be considered as the DSG limit, right? And then if we increase C0, we eventually cross another, uh, we, we eventually find another phase where at equilibrium, uh, there are three different fixed points, three different solution. And two of them are going to be stable. And the third one is going to be unstable. And if we, and if you increase even more the um, C0, right? We find another, um, another phase that we call B minus where uh, we have only one fixed point, but this time the, fixed, the, the solution is a low output solution and therefore is a very pessimistic uh, phase. And uh, we somehow we discard the, the study of this phase. But another, um, Actually, there, there is another uh, phase that appears when we introduce, um, when we get out of the equilibrium, so when we introduce the shocks. And this is the, the, what we call the phase B plus. 
And to explain a little bit better to the phase B plus, we can see as this sigmoid, so this uh, S-shaped function has been uh, a stripe, right? That can move um, because of the, re the realization of the noise uh, Z of T. And eventually there is a possibility where at equilibrium, we have only one fixed point, which represented by a high output scenario, but then uh, a realization, uh, a, a a realization of the noise can introduce a scenario where we have back the three uh, fixed point uh, solution. So with this in mind, we present four phases. And when we have four phases, it is um, uh, when we understand how to define the phases, we can also dra draw a phase diagram that is shown here as a function of the people sensitivity theta and the confidence threshold uh, um, C0. And so even though we don't have uh, much happening in phase A, the phase A um, is, the, is the DSG limit, right? But even in this DSG limit, the feedback mechanism uh, allows for an endogenous excess of, of volatility, meaning that uh, the exogenous shock are amplified by the endo endogenously uh, by the feedback mechanism, and therefore the, the fluctuation are bigger uh, than in a standard DSG model. But now uh, the most interesting part of this phase diagram is um, the crossover between the phases P plus and C, or uh, the critical line between the phase uh, B plus and C, right? And because we can see, as, as I mentioned, uh, in the phase B plus, we have uh, at equilibrium, we have only one high output solution, but eventually we can, we can collapse. While in the phase C, uh, there is a bistability that is uh, intrinsic to the phase. And this can be seen because uh, uh, if you uh, look uh, at the solution here, uh, we can draw a dynamics, right? We can plot the dynamics of the, of the aggregate, aggregate, aggregate consumption over the time. And what we find if we um, just compare the two dynamics in the, in the phase uh, for a choice of parameter that uh, correspond to the phase B plus and a choice of parameter that corresponds to the phase C, we can really see that in the phase B, the system, the consumption, the aggregate consumption oscillate uh, around an equilibrium and every now and then, the, every now and then, there are spikes towards uh, um, downwards that represent somehow um, a crisis. And this can be seen when uh, plotting the distribution uh, just in the bottom panel. Uh, we can see that uh, basically the system oscillates around an equilibrium, but there are a few points that are just somewhere else. While it's in the real, uh, it is in the uh, C phase that we have this uh, inner, uh, the, the proper by stability where the system oscillates around a high output equilibrium, right? And then um, the system collapse. And this is highlighted of course, by the, the mm, if we plot the distribution of those realization of the aggregate consumption, where we can see that there are clearly um, two steady states that, uh, um, around which the system oscillate. So intuitively what's happening is that <clears throat> we have a dynamical double equilibrium DSG, right? So we can think about it in physical terms. We have a double well potential and we have, for example, a ball that oscillates around uh, the lower minima, let's say, that is now represented in this uh, graph, for example, by a known by a high output uh, regime, so a known crisis state. So we perturb the ball uh, with some exogenous shock, and eventually there is a realization, a particular realization of the shock that allows for the ball to jump over the barrier H and get trapped in another minima. And then again, the ball starts oscillating around this new minima that now represents a crisis regime. And another realization of the shock can allow um, the ball to jump over the barrier that this time is, we can call it H prime, which is much smaller. And the ball is allowed to go to the former state. 
And what we found uh, a very uh, interesting result is that the average time before a recession occurs uh, depends exponentially on the height of this barrier H uh, divided by, of course, the, the standard deviation of the exogenous shock that we are considering. But this um, pose some, some dilemmas, right? Because um, this, this height of the barrier depends on the parameters of the model. And if we think that we want to somehow to calibrate the model with real data, when considering real data, we know that we have some, some errors, some statistical error that are made. But in this case, what we have is that even the smallest error on, on one of the parameter um, of this model is somehow amplified dramatically by this exponential, right? For example, if I make just the 10% of error over one of the parameter, then uh, I can fail my prediction by an entire order of magnitude. And this uh, recalls uh, somehow the chaos theory that we have in physics, where the trajectories of the system are hypersensible to the initial condition. And even a small change in those initial condition, and we are talking about the uh, one atom uh, of, this, of difference can lead to a completely different uh, uh, dynamics. And what we want to highlight here is that uh, the simple gentrification lead to a really um, a lot of interesting effects. But the key point of um, the key point for us are, are narratives that are uh, that are that must be exploited by the mm, policymakers to restore the trust. So to move. Uh, back and forth, this, param this parameter C0, um, this confidence uh, threshold C0 that we model. And to restore, for example, the, the confidence in people and to move uh, away from a collapsed economy or just to get the farther possible to the phase C. And, and why it's key, the, why, why the narratives are key, the, the problem is that the behavior of, of, of this uh, model is highly nonlinear, right? So um, any small change uh, in this confidence threshold can lead, uh, if, if we are, of course, uh, near to the critical lines, can lead to, to a phase transition. It's a little bit like uh, water. If I'm a policymaker and I want to provide water, then I and I can tune the temperature as much as I want, then I would be uh, it would be a smart choice to just take zero plus rather than zero minus. And even if the temperature is just um, the temperature different between the two uh, states are, is, is very tiny, but we have a completely different output. On the one hand, we have ice. On the other hand, we have water. So this is the key. And we, we do think that uh, the parameters, the, the confidence threshold, and uh, of course, also the sensitivity of people that works in both uh, both uh, direction, uh, they can be tuned by policymakers through narratives. So if I have to sum up a little bit uh, this first part, uh, we have introduced a uh, dynamical multi-equilibrium DSG, right? This, uh, this model introduces uh, some endogenous uh, demand-driven crisis because uh, people just stop consuming. And we pointed out, of course, the importance of narratives or the influence that can have policymakers over, over, over the parameters of these models to affect uh, the probability, uh, the crisis probability through uh, the sensitivity, uh, through the confidence that of people. And now if we want to do another step through towards uh, the ABM uh, landscape, uh, we, can, we can actually uh, focus about the, the heterogeneous case, right? Uh, when where the um, the social uh, the, the network structure GIJ is now an arbitrary network that can be modeled, in, we will see later. And of course now uh, households are heterogeneous, so the the macroeconomical variables are are going to be local, in the sense each household has its proper consumption, its proper. Uh, labor provides uh, different labor, it has a different wage, etc., so on and so forth. Um, the, 
the way we proceed is very similar. It's, it's actually uh, almost the same as in the previous case, just the equation are a little bit more, more complex, but uh, nothing, uh, nothing major. And we can highlight um, again, the three, uh, the individual labor for each household, the individual consumption and the real wages. And it's this last term that actually encodes the, um, the way we, we, can, we can introduce the heterogeneities because if we see those, uh, uh, those real wages are proportional to the technology that is entrusted to each agent because we do suppose now that um, each agent has different technology. So there is a global exogenous shock that is called now Zeta and the term Z of I uh, differs from one agent to the other. And as those, uh, as those, um, as this term actually, um, uh, as the as the wages linear uh, on the scales, uh, we do know that the distribution of wages follow an exponential law. Of course, uh, if we do not consider the financial market, uh, etc., and. And therefore we draw those variables with uh, an exponential distribution and the exponential distribution is um, modulated by two parameters. The first one is mu, which is just the steepness. So the inequalities that we are uh, injecting, uh, the level of heterogeneity, the wages that we are uh, introducing. And the second one can be, can be seen as the, the mean value, right? So if we want to do a connection with uh, a real life problem, the parameter mu can be interpreted as a, the Gini income uh, index. And in particular for an exponential distribution, the Gini index and this parameter mu are connected by this simple law that is highlighted um, here in the slide. And, and the second one is the average of the skills, but being the average of the skill, uh, basically the, um, the, the average wage this uh, should be somehow proportional, right, to the um, GDP per capita mm, that we have in, in the, the one country that we are trying to, um, to model or to parameterize. So once we have introduced the heterogeneity, so we, we associate to each household a different level of, uh, of skill, we now have to build a social structure, a social network. And we do know that, uh, you know, intuition uh, give uh, intuition give us the response somehow to this question because we do know that people that uh, somehow share the same level of income, in reality, tend to cluster together, right? Uh, for example, I don't know in London, people with high high um, higher income they can be found, for example, in Chelsea. And so uh, we place a bond between two agent. Uh, looking at their difference in the skill level, of course. And this probability, so we place a bond with, with a probability that depends on this distance. And the probability is also modulated by, by a temperature lambda, which somehow determine the level of segregation of the graph. So to visualize better this effect, we can, for example, uh, plot uh, in solid, uh, in the solid blue line, the individual skill distribution, right? And the pink uh, dots just represent the, the average skill of uh, unagent uh, neighbors. So when I take lambda very small, then uh, as you can see, the, the, the pink dot just overlap uh, the, the, blue, the blue line meaning that every agent just is looking at people that have in average the same exact, some, same with some perturbation of course, but the same exact level of income as himself. While in the other case, when Lambda is big, then people just choose other agent at random and they place a bond, bonds at random, like the links are placed at random and therefore uh, the average um, that I'm observing myself is going to converge to the uh, to the mean of the distribution. And now let's do, let's move a step uh, backwards, right? So we have introduced heterogeneity, we have, um, we have a social network, but uh, we do also have... Uh, uh, sir, 
Sorry, Federico, but yes. uh, uh, so Marco at the uh, Pangalo at the uh, I think a quick question for you, Marco. Go ahead. Um, hi, um, I just wanted to know. Um, so you summing over J in the previous slides, but it's uh, not clear to me. Like, uh, what are you summing over? Like uh, here, is it? Uh, oh, yeah, the, the previous slide. Sorry. So, can, can you just? Yeah. Uh, no, no. Please go next. Uh, still next. All right. So here, this is the whole population. Mm -hmm. And then in the following slides, is it still the whole population or just the neighbors? Here. No, um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I understood the question, but the, the idea is that here we define um, the heterogeneity. So we associate uh, basically some lab, some, some skill level to each agent. So we have the, the, the set of households and these households is like just labeled with a different skill level. And then here we build the social structure. So the, we place the bond between the uh, between two households with, with, with a certain probability, right? Right, but, but then I guess, can you go one more slide on? On here. Uh, still one, sorry. Oh, no, no, sorry, just before. So that was right. So here you sum in over J, but now that's just the neighbors. Yes. In this case, I see. So what matters over, like in the simulation is the, it, to determine like the general macroeconomic properties is the full set of agents. But here mm -hmm. you're just looking at the neighbors. Okay, thank you. Sorry for... Um... No problem. <laughs> uh, and so here we were. Um... So we have introduced the heterogeneities, we have introduced uh, the social network. Uh, and the idea is that there is no reason, right, for people having the same exact confidence threshold and the same exact sensitivity, just because they are different. And, and therefore, we can set without loss of, of, uh, of generality, the, confi the individual confidence threshold as being modulated by a global uh, confidence threshold, which we call C0 bar. Uh, times the skill level of each agent modulated by a certain exponent beta one. And on the other hand, um, uh, the sensitivity are modulated by a global sensitivity theta bar and they are, in, uh, and they are, and they are multiplied by the skill level to, a, to an exponent minus beta two. And now if we take back the, the phase diagram that we showed in the last, uh, <clears throat> uh, in the last part, we can see that each nozzle now uh, represents a dot in the phase diagram. And the union of the set of those houses, in this case, lives into a line and into the blue line, for instance. And the flash just point towards uh, the way, the, the increasing, uh, the, the richest end of the population, let's say like that. So we have now uh, introduced two supplementary parameters, beta one and beta two, that are uh, exponent. And we have to study um, basically the model uh, with respect to C0 bar, theta bar, beta one and beta two. But how do those parameters uh, actually affect uh, the model itself? So we can see that if we change the parameter C0, we simply move uh, this line um, right and left in the phase uh, space, right? On the other hand, if we change uh, theta bar, just the line move vertically. And if we change beta one and beta two, uh, we, we actually, what we are doing, we are changing the, um, the concavity of, of this parametrization of our, of our agent. And now the important question is, um, we, so we know we have, we have introduced in the previous part that there is some, some, some kind, we can define some crisis, of course. And therefore, we can, we can actually study the dynamic of those crises. And what is very interesting is that uh, if we let beta 1 and beta 2 changing, we have a rich variety of dynamics. So as you can see here, for example, from the left to the right is um, in, in the leftmost panels, we can see uh, crises are highlighted with uh, colors. So we can see that crises spread uh, almost uniquely among poor agents. And every now and then there are spikes towards the, the, rich and, uh, the richest end of the population. While in the rightmost pan panel, the, the red one, 
the situation is exactly the opposite. So the, the crisis just spread among the richest end, and then we have spikes towards the poorest end. And in the middle, there is uh, some kind of um, uh, some, some, some overlap between those two phases and the crisis just spread all over the population without looking uh, really at the, at the income of the people they are affecting. But there's another striking uh, property here, which is uh, actually the, phenomenal, the phenomenology of the crisis is really different if we consider a segregated network or a non-segregated network. In fact, uh, if we think a little bit more carefully, when we assume that uh, the network is segregated, we create a, a somehow an effect of myopia, right? Because people do estimate the health the, of the society just looking at people sharing a comparable level of income. While, and, and this effect actually maximizes uh, the dominant effect or an avalanche, if you want, uh, fragilizing the crises that are more exposed um, to recession, to economic recession, while in a non-segregated regime, then the, the, my trust as a poor agent can be boosted because I'm looking at a wealthier, at the most rich um, agent, and therefore I think that the economy is going really well. But now there are basically two directions where we can um, study uh, the property of those crises, right? So the first direction, is we can actually monitor what is the average time spent in a recession state by an agent, by an individual, as a function of its income. And for example, we can compare two agents uh, that represent just the richest and the poorest decile in our, in our income spectrum. And the second, um, the second direction is simply looking at it, each time step, how many people are actually in a recession state, right? And we can draw, for example, the histogram of this indicator and to discover some properties. And what is striking is that in both those directions, we find a, mm, a phase transition. So if we focus on the first, um, so in, in the first case, we can, for example, plot uh, as a function of beta one and beta two, um, the, we can, the ratio okay, of, of uh, the crisis time that the, that the poorest guy spend in, in a, that, I mean, that the, the, the agent representing the poorest decile spend um, in a recession uh, divided by what is uh, the richest doing. And what we found is that as a function of beta one and beta two, there are three zones basically. The first one, and light blue is where the lower wages are more affected by the crisis. The second one as uh, dark blue and, and pink in, in the figure is where the crisis just equally spread uh, into the two ends of the population. And then the third one, the red one is where the richest SL is more affected by the crisis. And we can also, uh, we can also monitor what is the dependence on the size of these dots that is proportional to the to the inequalities in this, um, in this observable. Um, so when we raise uh, the Gini index and therefore the, the parameter mu, we see that the size of the dots just grows, meaning that um, the effects are even amplified by, by, this, by, by, by the augmentation of the, of the inequality. And this graph just uh, show how exponent beta one and beta two that we introduced uh, just, just before, they play a crucial role uh, when to determine which social class is more affected by the crisis. And this, a uh, few, few days ago, I heard um, this Mario Draghi speech to, to the Senato, where he said a little bit, he said that poverty has also worsened. Right? He was talking about the COVID-19 crisis and how it impacted the, the Italian society and in general, um, our societies. So poverty has also worsened from one year to the next, the incidence of the new poor rose from 31% to 45%. And the effects on inequality are serious and few historical precedent. Without public intervention, the Gini coefficient have increased by four percentage point in the first half of 2020. And this, this is a little bit what we are seeing here, right? So we increase the Gini coefficient, so mu becomes larger, uh, 
the dots become larger too, meaning that the inequality people, uh, poor people, for example, spend more time in a recession state. And the second, um, the second direction uh, I wanted to analyze with you is the direction uh, where we investigate what is the portion of the population, right, that they called X, X, um, X uh, smaller, which is the portion of the population that is actually uh, in a crisis state. And here we can see um, another phase transition, right, uh, with the increasing of the inequalities. So when the inequalities are, are, are very low or near to zero, uh, we have somehow a binary state, right? So people are all equal. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter how we place the, our connection because people are equal. And therefore we have basically two states, only one state where everyone is out uh, uh, of the crisis, right? And the other state where everyone is, is in a recession state. But when we switch on the, the inequality, so when we increase this parameter mu, then we see that this bi-stability, uh, this, um, this bi-model regime is replaced by a unimodal regime, which means that crisis just uh, affect one fraction uh, of the population and they very rarely and almost uh, with zero probability they affect the whole population. So when I increase mu I will have that uh, uh, one hand of the society and this one hand depends strongly on the choice of beta one and beta two is completely non-affected by, by the crisis. And finally um, um, there is this uh, we tried uh, to uh, see whether it was possible to calibrate our model uh, with, with real data. It was more an, uh, somehow an exercise. Uh, but the interesting part is that it exists a, a region, a very tiny region in the parameter space uh, where the, somehow the prediction of our model, they, they kind of overlap with, uh, with the real data. And the, 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 solute, the, the, the result of our model are really uh, dependent on the choice of the parameter beta one and beta two that we have introduced in this second part. And the result that better um, fit the data are just provided by a segregated network. So if I have to sum up a little bit uh, this last part, we have introduced um, some heterogeneous households that differ with, uh, for their income level and their social network. And we find a rich variety of possible uh, crises that spread uh, among the different social classes. And we show how the global economical crises are affected by the parameter. And when I, uh, I recall this by, by model to unimodal uh, transition, and finally, we have compared the prediction of our model with real data, so showing that it exists uh, an overlap. And the last very, um, this is an on ongoing project that I, I wanted to share with you, is that in what we have done so far, it was uh, about the consumption driven crisis. So the idea is that people were, do not want to consume anymore. But in fact, it, it, it seems like to be a little bit realistic that people can't consume because uh, the capital is not anymore there. Yeah. And so what we are trying to reproduce here, and we have some promising result, is that we have some capital crisis, right? That also drop the consumption simply because the firm cannot produce. And with, la with that, I would like to thank you and I will be uh, glad to answer all your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Federico, especially for uh, leaving um, quite a bit of time for questions. So, do we have any? Do we have any questions for, uh, for Federico? You can you can put an asterisk uh, in the in the chat box. So, so in the meantime, um, maybe I have. Uh, I have a question. So, um, so it wasn't very clear to me uh, how much of your results um, are analytical results, and how much are uh, how much of it is you know numerical okay. results. Because you showed some uh, uh, you know 
I think uh, noisy dynamics, which I mm -hmm. assumed were you know, numerical simulations, but yes. they also made some statements. So I uh, so can you tell us maybe a little bit about yes. the solution technique for the model and okay. uh, you know? Okay, for example, in this first part, uh, there is a lot of analytic, uh, a lot of. Uh, for example, the phase diagram is fully analytic. You can you can actually draw those line. Uh, there is some equation that uh, just you can compute the, the yeah, you critical compute, lines you can compute the critical lines exactly and and yeah in the first in the, the homogeneous case there is quite a bit that can be achieved analytically while uh, when we uh, when we um, yeah this result is numerical for example we just plot the dependence of the the crisis probability and log linear uh, access and we found that uh, this relation holds but when we actually we move uh, to for example the non uh, the, the heterogeneous uh, case uh, then results are, are almost uh, uh, those results are of course analytical uh, they're also quite tricky at the end to uh, it's nothing it's nothing impossible to, to do but it's, a, it's a, little, a little bit more complicated right and, and this is, uh, of course, analytical, but uh, also the way we implement the, for example, the, the structure of the network is numerical. We have a, perform a Monte Carlo algorithm, for example. And then, uh, well, this is just a simulation, but yeah. then we can't say much about, uh, from now on, uh, it's almost uh, everything is numerical. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so, Eddie, uh, at the question, so how did you want yeah. to? So uh, really nice work. Um, I have two questions. Um, and one relates to the crisis. So this is the, what you call the DSG framework. Uh, what patterns do you find in the time domain for the crisis? Uh, so why I'm asking this is the following. So I have a it's a different model, uh, but there are some similarities here uh, with respect to yours in the sense that I have a, in this model, I have a financial sector, which interacts with the real one, and there is uncertainty regarding the risk distribution. And then kind of introduced that uncertainty through the optimization problem of the households. Actually, of course, that starts affecting the economy. And what I interestingly find is that um, kind of initially the crisis occur pretty rare, but if there is a state where actually it enters and where there is double dip and triple dip recession that appears. In your framework, would that be possible? Uh, do you see any type of more stable crisis versus less stable crisis, I can call it like that. That's uh, kind of a very rough terminology, but can you mm -hmm. kind of derive this to type of subsets of crisis? I'll, um, so- um... Let me stop there first. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I try to answer if I if I miss the true answer that you were expecting, please stop me. Um, so in this first part, right? Uh, sorry, wh where is it? Uh, here, here, here we have. Um, I mean, the crisis are somehow all um, equal in a sense. They differ just in, in. I mean, in the C phase, for example, what I described, the crises are just. All of them are at the same level. Just we have a bi-stability, so the system oscillates around two equilibria. So of course, just um, the consumption switches to the high equilibri equilibrium to the low equilibrium. So in this regard, uh, no, we don't have intermediate crises, and the crises are uh, occurs in a very tiny time lapse. So we don't have, uh, for example, low, slow recession or slow recoveries. We have just uh, recession or recoveries. And uh, and then yeah, the the more we move, uh, um, the more we increase C zero inside the phase C, the more uh, this uh, this there is a disproportion, right? So uh, the time we spend in a recession state becomes much larger. Uh, when we when we consider in reality the heterogeneous case, we don't have this clear by stability. Uh, so there is uh, somehow the crisis can be uh, a little bit smoother if we compare the levels of consumption. 
uh, but again, it's it's just uh, there is an indicator which is um, yeah. I think there is some somehow another level of bistability which is a little bit more complicated to understand. But um, the bistability is always there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Um, now, the second question was regarding the uh, so heterogeneity and social networks. So kind of. That's in the, if I understood it correctly, I'm, I'm sorry, I jumped in a bit later, maybe mm -hmm. in the presentation. Yes, yes. Um, so the social network talks about how the agents are related, but if you transfer that social network into a market-focused analysis, what would you- A, ma a market-focused analysis. Uh, exactly, because, so kind of the way we introduce heterogeneity in DSG is usually through markets. Yes. It's not through social structures. Mm -hmm. So how would you kind of correspond that uh, social structure into the market structure of, of the analysis and what advice can you give us in, uh, in terms of modeling the interaction of heterogeneous agents through a market-oriented uh, approach rather than a... Uh, with market, you're, you're meaning the financial market? Well, it could be financial market, it could be goods market or uh, uh, any other. Uh -huh. um, uh. Well, I, I think there is, I, I don't have a precise answer to your question, right? I can just um, think a little bit with you. Uh, the, pro, the, the, the idea here is that we want to model the social interaction. So it's quite uh, straightforward to put a social network that just links uh, different agents. Um, if we want to do somehow um, in, in the market structure, we'd, we would have to assume that uh, we have different firms right? Uh, several different firms that, mm -hmm. that produce different products. And they are somehow coupled like by some, some kind of, exactly some kind of self network. And I, I'm just thinking, uh, uh, and it would be very, very interesting to put, uh, instead of a Cobb Douglas production function, maybe a Leontiev production function, right? So if there is one firm that fails, uh, then uh, let's say firms A that fails, then there is maybe firms H that is connected to firm uh, A because it's producing, I don't know, cars and for producing car, you need wheels and, and firm A produce wheels and, but it can only provide uh, three wheels. And eventually this has stopped the production of, also of uh, firm H. And... Let me turn it around the question then. Um... So if I've understood this correctly, your social network here, mm -hmm. kind of that social structure would exist even if agents do not take an active decision simply because they're in space in the same space. So there, there's this, uh, the spatial dimension here, the fact that they're poor or rich or whatever, which connects them, but they don't per se necessarily need to interact. Meanwhile, in the market focus one, they need to actually take decisions and take the planning Kind of they need to kind of allocate resources actively in order for them to create a social structure. If they don't, there is no social structure as such. Or am I thinking this wrong? Or uh, I, I'm I'm not sure I fully understand your point. Mm. Uh. Otherwise, I mean, if anyone anyone else has questions, please jump in. I mean, I just I'm trying to kind of derive. The because I understood it here, what really kind of influences or transmits the shocks across the different groups in your heterogeneous continuum mm -hmm. is the fact that they are congregated around some kind of poor areas and richer areas. That's kind of that's a construction by the fact that we are living in an area, in a physical area where we are kind of uh, just interacting with our cohort. That's one mm -hmm. aspect, but that, co I mean, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to kind of uh, take positions in the market. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. whether, <clears throat> whether you're studying here behavior of heterogeneity within cohorts, or are you kind of, trying to understand in which way is all of this heterogeneity starting interacting in one market, how uh, their endogenous 
separation would happen, if you see what I mean. Uh, Eddie, maybe, um, so I think, I think maybe this is mostly a matter of interpretation, if I understand, I mean, Federico can correct me, but uh, the point here is that the social network is there because you form your confidence, if you want, um, mm -hmm. that will allow to consume based on the consumptions only of some agents, not of all agents. Yeah, then you, you can, can then you can put whatever interpretation you want to it, right? Because you even live in a neighborhood and maybe experience a certain, uh, you know, level of consumption no, but, around you, but it's probably not in the model. I, I think if you want to to go a step further, right? Uh, here we have a quench network, right? The network doesn't change. Um, I, I don't improve my situation either. So even the heterogeneities are quenched. So everything is decided at the beginning. So uh, I can also think about doing something which is uh, dynamical, right? So if somehow I can improve my condition and therefore the network changes and there is some kind of dynamic in it. And this and that where out of the market would enter. Okay, so that's because actually through interactional uh, through markets would potentially change this allocation of resources. Ah, yeah, yes, AC. yes, yes, of course. That's the problem is that here the 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 mm -hmm. genetics and therefore uh, the wages are not an output of the of the of the model but an input yeah. they are an input mm -hmm. but they can be modified with some uh, i don't know with some uh, with some law that needs of course to be defined but you know if i if i live in a high output for 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 a while then why not keep getting a promotion and just improve my condition or I take the place of someone else, but I uh, keep my bonds, right? Like my, my links with mm -hmm. my, I have the, my, the same friends. Okay, um, so um, conscious of time, maybe. Is there any other, uh, is there any other question? Okay. Okay, so if not, um, again, thank you very much to uh, Federico for the, for the presentation. Um, I'll just remind everyone that the next uh, seminar of the series will be the 11th of March. Uh, Severin Rice will be, the, um, will be our speaker. He'll talk about an aging-based exploration of the macroeconomic effects of COVID-19. I'm sure everyone will be uh, you know, very interested in this. And uh, thanks again, Federico. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thanks, everyone, for joining again. And uh, see you in two weeks.